first speaker comes to us um, by courtesy of Queensland College of the Arts. And um, we're really, really thrilled. He's, you're a Melbourne boy, though, at the moment now. Um, Dr. Peter Knight. Um, Peter Knight is a multidisciplinary musician who has gained wide acclaim for his elect eclectic approach, which integrates jazz, world music, and experimental approaches. Peter's work as both a performer and a composer is regularly featured in a range of ensemble settings. He also composes for theatre, creates sound installations, and in 2013, he was appointed artistic director of the Australian Art Orchestra, which means that we have the great pleasure of him. Finished, uh, holds a doctorate from the Queensland Conservatorium, Griffith University, and awarded 2013 Alumnus of the Year. So, very distinguished man. Please, uh, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that um, lovely introduction, Barbara. And it's a, a, a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so as Barb mentioned, I'm going to have to pick up my notes because I can't see well enough to see them down there. But as Barb mentioned, I'm a, I'm a composer and trumpeter from Melbourne. Um, I've actually always lived in Melbourne. I, I completed a doctorate at the Queensland Conservatorium, uh, but I was living in Melbourne at the time and did a lot of travelling. Um, and uh, I, as she also mentioned, I began my career, I've always been really a jazz musician, and I certainly came out of the jazz uh, tradition, and I, I, I studied jazz at, at university when I was younger. Um, but I've since branched into ever more idiosyncratic areas of music making. Um, my role at the Art Orchestra now includes programmer and curator, I guess, and um, so applying kind of the um, different skills that I've picked up along the way in, in very different contexts. Uh, during my DMA at uh, Queensland Conservatorium, I developed and refined a language of sounds created using the trumpet, um, real-time laptop processing, along with uh, a range of pedals, speakers and a guitar amplifier. And this is what I'm going to concentrate on today. Um, this project um, led me to examine my practice in new ways, to learn new skills and new approaches to performance. Um, in it, I bring together contemporary approaches to the trumpet, and technology developing an idiosyncratic and highly personalised sound world. So this paper uh, presents um, an overview of this particular mode of expression, which is one among a few that I uh, have um, variously focused on and continue to focus on. Um, it, uh, it presents an overview uh, through uh, demonstration and discussion and touches on aspects of uh, the methodology used to contextualise this creative work within a practice-based research framework in, in my doctorate. stop because for the first time since I loaded this up the video is not working it's very strange we had it working perfectly before so here we are sorry about that
simple, I have a CD, and uh, this is what it sounds like acoustically, R roughly. <laughs> I've got another piece um, recorded using a similar approach. Um, and this time, uh, I, I wrap it, it's, it's the same kind of thing. Contact mic on a CD, CD over the bell of the trumpet. Uh, but this time, I just route the uh, signal from the contact mic directly through a volume pedal, a distortion pedal, and into a guitar amplifier. And I use the volume pedal to attenuate the feedback uh, that can result, um, depending on, on on what kind of uh, velocity you have the uh, volume set at. Um, so I'll give you the acoustic sound first this time. It sounds a bit like And when I uh, combine that with the uh, processing environment that I've set up, it sounds like this. simple techniques, but uh, it took a long time to get to them. My research during my DMA at the Queensland Con uh, documented the development of this spot solo project as well as a suite of works for sextet called Fish Boaster Fishing. And these works were framed within an investigation of the meeting points of uh, composition and improvisation in my practice. And one of the reasons I embarked on this project is because I wanted to delve deeper into my creative process. As I mentioned before, I'd spent years um, playing jazz and uh, trying to learn to be a, a good bebop player. And I'd become gradually more restless. Um, what was I really trying to do? And what did I actually really want to communicate as an artist? So George Lewis um, writes about jazz improvisation and notes that its differentiating uh, characteristics include its welcoming of agency, social necessity, personality and difference as well as its strong relationship to popular and folk cultures. And his words uh, really resonated and still resonate with my experience of being drawn to jazz as a young man and also to my later experience of feeling a need to move away from it, at least in the sense of style and idiomatic expression. And he goes on to say that the development of the improviser in improvised music is regarded as encompassing not only the formation of individual music personality, but the harmonisation of one's musical personality with social environments. And if you know anything about the development of jazz and particularly the kind of current politics around jazz and the, um, the idea that it could be a canonical form like European classical music, um, that statement by George Lewis is, is radical and, uh, and, and incredibly helpful for an artist like me. So in this sense, um, a musician's development as an improviser in the jazz tradition, or as Lewis would say from an astrological starting point, is about allowing, gradually allowing, one's personality and culture to speak through music. And so the, these ideas were crucial to the development of this solo project and to the process of thinking about who I was as a musician in the, co in the context of the culture I'd grown up in. I documented this self-inquiry in my exegesis as an auto, in an auto using an autoethnographic approach. I kept journals and included journal entries in my exegesis. 
And I tried to make the task of writing about my work an integral part of the creative process rather than, account, than an account of it. And I guess, um, I guess the comparison between uh, jazz improvisation and autoethnography is, is too obvious not to be touched upon here, although I'm uh, certainly not the first to draw such a parallel. Stacey Holman-Jones describes torch singing as a form of autoethnography, and Deborah Reed Danahay writes that autoethnography and torch singing both enact a life story within larger cultural and social contexts and histories. Instrumental jazz, too, enacts life stories within social contexts and, and histories, or should, if we follow Lewis's thinking. I'm also reminded of my own development as an improviser and my experience of cultural dislocation uh, when, uh, when, I, when Reed Danahay notes, the most cogent aspect to the, the study of autoethnography is that of cultural displacement or the situation of exile, characteristic of the themes expressed by autoethnographers, whether the autoethnographer is the anthropologist studying his or her own kind, the native telling his or her life story, or the native anthropologist, this figure is not completely at home. She might have added, the Australian musician str tr struggling to find authentic expression in the context of idioms and forms imported from America and Europe. As I developed as a musician, this feeling of not being completely at home became more acute, and I've spent the last 15 years or so working towards developing my own language as an improviser and my own forms as a composer. I think of myself now as an improvising musician, and a composer, I guess, uh, rather than a jazz musician, uh, because I've consciously moved away from the sounds of idiomatic American jazz. At a certain point in my development, I couldn't ignore uh, the, the, the question of what American jazz, jazz music has to do with a, a boy who grew up in country Victoria and Melbourne listening to Sherbet and Gary Glitter and the Skyhooks, <laughs> and whose background in music performance consisted of brass band and school orchestra. To paraphrase White Oak, I began to wonder what I was doing playing music that developed in a completely different physical, spiritual and social environment to that in which we live. Interestingly though, my journey follows the paradigm of aphrological improvisation that Lewis describes uh, and which he distinguishes from the urological. In fact, um, I, I believe that I'm closer to his notion of, of jazz uh, now than what I was uh, when I was recreating the sounds of jazz in terms of musical style and, and, and idiomatic expression. so large, I've <laughs> just got a little fright. Um, so I'll, I'll try to talk a little bit about what I'm doing here. And uh, I've, some of the material I've prepared, I guess, is probably more for an audience of, of musicians. But um, as well as processing my trumpet and flugelhorn through the laptop, um, I expand the environment. I'll talk a bit about the digital environment in a minute, but um, I expand the environment by, by using two clip-on bell microphones, volume pedal, distortion pedal, as I mentioned, um, and a guitar amplifier. Um, so one microphone is routed to the guitar amplifier and the other is routed straight into my laptop via a sound card and is set up to capture the natural trumpet sound. So then I, I also run a signal out of the guitar amplifier into the laptop and, and I can independently process that as well. So this setup allows me to generate and control feedback from the amplifier to the volume pedal. Uh, I can set up the feedback um, using the clicking of the valve. Um, 
and I use these clean sounds and smooth sounds to kind of juxtapose it so I can set up a, a, a duet. Laptop that I'm kind of controlling, but kind of not controlling too. And one of the things I like about this work is I'm never really totally in control of it. And, uh, and things go off into directions I'm, I'm not quite sure of. There's a, there's a chaotic element that's um, introduced particularly by the guitar and the feedback, but also by some of the plugins which are, um, you know, have uh, their own kind of feedback uh, loops contained in the software, and so it's. Um, I enjoy that um, unpredictability. Just turn it up a, a little bit again. And this is where I kind of end up. And so uh, gradually the sounds accrete and, um, and, uh, and I work with the materials that arise as I, as I improvise. Um, quickly on the digital environment, um, as is evident from this journal entry from uh, my DMA exegesis, um, I, work, I worked for some time on refining digital environments within which I can improvise and identifying plugins that produce processing effects fitting the aesthetic I want to produce. The primary software for the project uh, is, was and is Ableton Live, um, which some will be familiar with, but I won't go into it too far because the technical aspects are, can be a little dull. But anyway, suffice to say, this, pro this program has some incredible features and some specific limitations too. It's difficult in an improvised setting to use the computer in an intuitive sensory manner to create textural variation. It's particularly difficult in a real-time uh, performance environment to trans imp translate impulse into form. And for me, my background as a jazz trumpeter and improviser has ensured that mu music making is as much a physical process as a cerebral one. Musical ideas come to me from doing as well as from thinking, and my musical imagination is triggered by the physical act of playing. I play two chords on the piano, and I'm drawn to respond with a third. So when I first started working with the computer in improvised settings, uh, I felt hemmed in by it like I was trapped by the gridded structure of the thing, and I couldn't translate my impulses into musical gestures. gestures. And I think this is a problem uh, many musicians and technicians have been grappling with since people started making music using computers. Um, the flexible setup that I've come up with um, has arisen because I like to change the instrumental preparations and the placement of uh, microphones, etc. Um, and uh, and that, that setup involves um, MIDI controllers. I've got a little MIDI controller that sits on my lap and I've got some other pedals. And uh, so these, these controllers allow me to not have to look at the computer too much um, and to, to, to respond to the sounds in a gestural, physical way uh, that kind of is, is a bit more like instrumental practice, acoustic instrumental practice. And um, I think that's what I was trying to achieve in getting over that hurdle of feeling hemmed in by the, by the technology. Um, limiting my palette was also a really crucial uh, part of realising uh, this work. Uh, solo performance is an incredibly challenging mode. And I had some interesting experiences when I began performing in this way. And um, there's nothing as terrifying as um, improvising and uh, having a half hour set in front of you and, and kind of finding it's just not really kind of happening. And uh, being out there and going, wow, I've got to do half an hour here. And I'm kind of stuck. But anyway, um, the, in short, the things that, that seemed to work when I was noodling around in my studio um, were much more difficult in performance. And as I noted before, I kind of felt creatively stifled rather than inspired by the addition of the technology. And I came to the conclusion that it wasn't just the physical layout of, uh, of my setup, it was just too many available choices. In response, I decided to use only sounds generated by the trumpet as the raw material for processing. And this, uh, this removes a, an array of possibilities offered in the digital realm, such as synthesized sounds and samples from other sources. This limitation was an important step for me as it gave the project focus and allowed me to move forward. In a sense, it gave me freedom. And Stravinsky 
talks about uh, the apparent contradiction of freedom created through self-imposed restraint in the poetics of music. He describes a kind of terror at the abyss of freedom that accompanies him, or that confronts him rather, in the moment of sitting to work on a composition. He writes, let me have something finite, definite matter that, that can lend itself to my operation only insofar as, as it is commensurate with my possibilities. And perhaps the range of possibilities one confronts with digital media is even more terrifying than that which Stravinsky uh, describes because literally anything is possible without even the limitations of technique as material from any source can be flown in at the mere push of a button. This democratisation of, uh, of, of music making which has accompanied sampling and processing of sound using computers has in a sense made musicality even more of a premium. While with a laptop and the appropriate software, anyone can put sounds together to create an ambience or a soundscape, fewer can use the same materials to delve deeper into the craft of composition to explore structure and other formal elements. And from the outset, uh, my aim uh, with this work um, has been, in a sense, to create compositions, even though this is about improvisation. Um, I kind of one of the things that I talk about in my exegesis is the fact that I, I see the digital environment that I've created, or rather digital environments that I've created um, as, as compositions. So they're, they're frameworks within an improvisation exists, but um, they're very specific sound worlds and there are very specific choices within them. Actually, they're not digital environments, they're partial, partially digital, partially analog. But anyway, they're, they're particular environments for processing sound. And, uh, so they are like the compositions and on the, the, um, the 60 minutes of work that I made during the course of the doctorate at, um, as solo performances there are, I think there's five um, different environments which I think of as compositions. So from the outset um, I was kind of really all about making uh, compositions that embodied and integrated improvisation. Um, rather than soundscapes, and for me, um, soundscapes are a bit different because they could be, you can listen to a soundscape, um, you know, the term is a very loose term, but you can, for me, you can listen to a soundscape from any moment um, to any moment and kind of get it. But with a composition, you need to listen on and, um, and, uh, and, and take in the whole thing in order to, to, to get what it is. Um, and for me, it doesn't really matter whether you're writing a pop song, a symphony, creating music concrete, or indeed a spontaneous composition. What we do when we compose music is balance consistency and variation to create interest and to create a sense of unfolding in time. And this is the constant that makes sense of the various strands of my diverse practice connecting what I do when I play jazz to what I do when I create in more abstract settings, such as in the context of this project. I use different means and materials and express different qualities of emotion and aesthetic, but these same basic principles apply. When music works, when a composition draws us on and makes us want to keep listening, it does so because consistency and variation are in balance. All this is a way of, of saying that one of the critical processes um, in the development of this solo work lay in the limiting of, limiting of materials, as mentioned earlier, identifying a small number of processing techniques and sound sources and using them in a focused way. And I've been using the same ones now for uh, getting on for 10 years. Um, it, it seems perhaps contradictory given that this is a project that embodies improvisation and experimentation. But here, as in many other traditions, the notions of improvisation and exploration do not equate to anything goes. I define the artistic terrain and explore it. Oh, yeah, we're back at Art Stravinsky, sorry. Um, so I've talked a, a fair bit now um, about how I developed this project. But before I finish up with a, a little bit more music, um, I'd like to return to my motivation for making uh, the work itself and the things that drive me creatively. And Lisa Lim speaks to this eloquently in the quote that uh, I've just projected. I'm going to read something um, from one of the last chapters of my exegesis, which, um, which is a as I mentioned, an autoethnographic auto approach. Um, and, and it's again talking about George Lewis, who's a really important inspiration for me. 
Lewis describes the process of learning to improvise in the jazz context as commencing with the emulation of other improvisers. And it occurs to me that the, the process of developing as an improviser is one of moving closer to the source of your inspiration, removing obstacles. And I think that probably applies across lots of fields, doesn't it? It's not just musical improvisation, but um, you know, developing as an artist is, is about uh, moving closer to the source of your inspiration removing obstacles, uh, psychological and technical, so you can speak through your musical art with your own voice and so that your culture and social environment can also find a way of speaking through your music. Lewis argues that the notion of the importance of personal narrative is one of the central aspects of Afrological improvisation. He seems to imply that it transcends style and idiom and when one tries to make, a sense, make sense of the range of uh, musical utterance described as jazz, from New Orleans, traditional, to avant-garde, downtown New York, it is, all, is this perspective that helps thread these superficially disparate musical phenomena together. It also helps me make sense of my path as an improviser from jazz and rock through cr cross-cultural collaborations uh, to abstract electroacoustic collaboration, um, you know, the, the theatre scores that I write, the work that I do, programming and curating. And, um, and I'd say one of the primary motivations I have as a musician today is uh, to find ways of making my music relevant to uh, the time and place in which I live. Creating music that draws on my background in jazz without being bound by the idiom. Uh, music that embodies the personal but has a quality of authenticity. And um, I'm just going to finish up with, um, with, some, with a, some music that was recorded last year at a performance um, in Copenhagen. And um, I might just stop at moments and talk a little bit about what I'm doing uh, in the context of what I've just said. Um, I would usually open up to questions. I don't know if we've got time for that. We might have, we haven't got to the five no, minute mark. We're, we're not okay, no problem. Well, if anybody would like to, talk afterwards. I mean, that would be, I'll be downstairs so we can have a chat.
scoreboard at the same time as I'm playing. And, uh, and so I'm able to stay in this kind of feeling of just being in sound and, uh, and responding to what's happening uh, between the amplifier and the trumpet and, uh, and then processing that sound and at times sampling it and playing it back. And, uh, and gradually, as I mentioned before, building up a kind of world of sound that I then start to manipulate a little bit more using the computer. And I'll just jump forward here. Ah, oh, thanks. 